right? <clears throat> okay, the book of Judges, please, in chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. I'm going to read the first 20 verses as we consider this portion together. So beginning in verse 1, uh, Judges 16, it says, Then went Samson to, to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and had wait for him all night and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green widths that are, were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the widths as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson, and be awaked out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And he said, she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee? When thine heart is not with me, thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. And the lords of the Philistines came upon, up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. 
And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us as we ponder it together uh, this morning. And we might uh, call this uh, Samson's three last journeys. And that's really how the passage breaks down. There's a, a journey of lust in verses one through three, where he goes uh, and sees a prostitute and goes in with her. And then in verses four through 20, there's a journey of love. And it talks about he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So a journey of love. And then the final one is a journey of of loss. And uh, that uh, breaks in uh, from verse uh, 21, basically his final journey, uh, when basically he is going to be uh, taken uh, to uh, <clears throat> basically to have his eyes uh, pushed out and uh, be binding and grinding and all the rest of it. So three journeys that are detailed for us here. A journey of lust, a journey of love, and a journey of loss. And I suppose a key thought that would be good to keep in our minds as we consider this portion uh, is the epistle of 1 John. Actually, there's a couple of references we might consider as we ponder this together. 1 John chapter 5 is the verse that I have particularly in my mind that I think gives us a suitable background to this passage. It says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And some have suggested that the whole world lieth in the lap of the wicked one. <laughs> and certainly we see Samson lying in uh, the, the lap of one of the wicked one's agents in Delilah in this particular chapter. And so it begins by this statement, then went Samson to Gaza. Uh, and of course, Gaza was about 40 miles, 64 kilometers from his own town of Zora. And again, originally, uh, Gaza was in the hands of Judah. Uh, if you look back to Judges chapter one, uh, you will read that it had been conquered uh, in the early days of Judges by the tribe of Judah. Verse 18 of chapter 1, it says, also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ashkelon and the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. So it had once been in the hands of the tribe of Judah, but now very clearly uh, it has been lost to them uh, and is now in the hands of the enemy, the Philistines. Notice it says that when Samson went to Gaza and he saw there a harlot and went into her. And again, we've been reminded as we've considered this study together of a verse in first epistle of John. And again, we'll just look there, chapter two and verse 16. And we've seen this repeated in Samson's experience. It says in, in first John two sixteen, it says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but of the world. And certainly we see Samson and the lust of the eyes. After judging Israel, we, we read there for 20 years, uh, he makes this journey and uh, he sees this woman. And if there were any uh, originally good motive in him going to Gaza, uh, certainly uh, once he saw that woman, uh, the motives changed and it became basically to satiate his own lust. And again, you might ask yourself the question, what, what is this Nazarite doing going into a prostitute? And of course, uh, it's a tragic thing to say, but I actually personally know <laughs> of uh, two uh, people, professing believers, who went into a prostitute. They, um, they paid a price for it. But, but, you know, I think we've got to remind ourselves that a Christian who is walking in the flesh is capable of anything. And, and again, I would just to remind ourselves, because I think sometimes we, we think, oh, that that's not possible. A true believer couldn't possibly do any of those things. And I think anybody that would say that doesn't understand the flesh. In Galatians 5, I want you just to, to pay attention as I read these verses. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, 
uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And But notice it says this list, it says envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, this list, as horrible as it is, is not exhaustive. Uh, it's, it, it, as far as the human imagination can take you, this list can go. And yet, um, we have the flesh, and it's very possible for the Lord's people to give in to the lust of the flesh and be capable of all kinds of horrendous things. I remember many years ago uh, in our New Tribes mission days, they uh, the, the principal or president of the mission came and spoke to students, uh, us students who were studying in the New Tribes training school. And his message was the sins of New Tribes missionaries. And he went through the different reasons people had been dismissed from the mission. And I want to tell you, it was a horrendous thing. And, and then he said, don't think that this is not something that you are capable of. And I really want to say this, if we, we need to be conscious of the fact that if I give in to the dictates of the flesh, capable of anything, and I believe that's true of all of us. So we need to be warned of this. Here's this, this Nazarite, and he's going into a prostitute. And how did he get there? Well, he went to the wrong places. <laughs> uh, and if you go to the wrong places, you see things that you shouldn't see. And you end up doing things that you shouldn't do. And so he does this. And again, we can go to wrong places without even leaving our home these days. Because of technology, it's possible for God's people to go to wrong places, visit wrong places, see wrong things, and as a result of that, be tempted to do wrong things. And so, again, we need to just be conscious of this. He was in a place where he ought not to have been. He saw things he ought not to have seen, and he ended up doing things that he ought not to have done. And so, again, we need to just have this right attitude. When we, we hear these things, we need to make sure that we're not um, deceived by the pridefulness of our own hearts and think, oh, that could never happened to me. I want you just to look at a couple of scriptures, Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And if we're filled with confidence in self, uh, we're in a very dangerous place. A pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And then in the New Testament, I want you just to look at a couple of scriptures uh, in first corinthians 10 it's kind of somewhat ironic as i've been studying this this week i'm studying first corinthians 10 uh, to speak on it uh, in two weeks time uh, at a, a camp i'm going to be doing a bible reading on first corinthians 10 and 11 so it's just interesting that these two passages have overlapped in my own study uh, but in verse 12 he says this wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Wow, it's a very sobering verse, isn't it? He that thinks he stands, take he lest he fall. And it's very appropriate here. Uh, we're seeing a description, just as you do in 1 Corinthians 10, of the follies of the people of God, people of God doing things that they should not do. We've got a big list here, five things that they were involved in. They were idolaters. They were committing fornication. They were tempting Christ. Uh, they were murmuring. And he goes through all the things that they, they were doing, and he says these things happen to them as in samples, as types, as pictures for us to learn from. And then he says, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he also fall. I'm glad it doesn't end there. We might ask the question, did Samson um, have to fail? Do we have to sin? Is it inevitable? And of course, the answer is a thousand times no. And the reason it's a thousand times no, verse 13 tells us, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But here's a wonderful promise. God is faithful. And what is he faithful to do? 
Well, it says, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And so what we could say is Samson didn't fail because the temptation was too strong or because it was inescapable. He failed because he toyed around and trifled with sin. He didn't take it seriously. And he kept putting himself in vulnerable situations because of the choices that he made. He chose the wrong company. He hung around in the wrong places. He was careless. And maybe he still felt that in the past he'd had, as we've already seen, some indiscretions. And uh, he, he still retained God's power despite the compromises. And maybe he was feeling a bit confident that he could keep on doing this and keep on kind of getting away with it in a sense that, that that he could still know something of God's power. And so we're reminded again of the words of the epistle to the Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's certainly seen God's abounding grace to him in the past, right? Even though he had done some silly things. And yet the answer again is, God forbid, perish the thought of it. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's the resounding answer. How should we live like that? And so it's possible for us to think, well, I've got away with it so far. God's grace has been good to me. Why not one more time? But we're going to see that in this instance, in this chapter, once too many. And the principle of Galatians 6, 7 comes into play it says simply this be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap and samson began to in this chapter reap some of the folly that he had sown on previous occasions and so verse two it says and it was told the gazite saying samson is come hither and they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day we shall kill him it seems that the gazites were surprised that he was to be found in their city it was somewhat inappropriate wasn't it for this nazarite to be in gaza and particularly to be visiting a prostitute and again it's sad when unsaved people know about the sins of the saints and their whereabouts and they would say what are you doing here <laughs> they know they expect something higher from those that profess to be the people of god they expect better of us and so it, they plan to use his unexpected visit to kill him and so they surround him and they're just waiting for their opportunity to rid themselves of this man who had been a trouble to them. And yet we read it once again of an amazing physical act of Samson. It says, and Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. Now, again, what an incredible physical feat this is. These gate posts would have been driven deep into the ground. And these city gates, if you've ever been to Israel and seen some of the gates of Jerusalem, uh, you realize these, these are very big, very heavy, solid. They're part of the defense of the city. Uh, they have to be of significance. And yet he is able to just pick them up and carry them uh, as if they're nothing. And it's an amazing thing. And I want to just think a little bit about the idea of the gate of the city for a moment. Uh, it's kind of significant in many ways because the gate of the city spoke about its power. It spoke of its security. Uh, it was a place of administration and business. 
Remember, we found that Lot was sat in the gate of Sodom. That would mean that he was part of the, the local administration of the city of Sodom. He'd kind of made it onto the council, if you like, uh, in the Book of Ruth, uh, when there's need of arrangements uh, concerning uh, the right to redeem Ruth and, of course, uh, her land and all the rest of it. And uh, so, uh, again, where does that take place? Well, it's in the gate of the city. And then when Absalom wanted to steal the heart of the people away, where did he go? He went to the gate of the city. And so it really speaks of the administrative authority, the, the, the power of a city. And so it's interesting that a promise that was made to Abraham back in Genesis 22, uh, we get at least a little bit of a, 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 a fulfillment of it here. Genesis 22, verse 17, where we read these words, God it's 21, 22, 17, and that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashores, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. <laughs> and so a promise that, that uh, Abraham's descendants would ultimately be victorious and possess the gate of their enemies. Uh, and so and again, we think of a New Testament promise in Matthew 16, verse 18, where the Lord Jesus said that I will build my church, my ecclesia, my called out company, and the gates, the, the powers, the authorities of hell shall not prevail against it. And so the Lord used it as a picture of his ultimate victory uh, through his people over even the uh, the very administrative powers and authorities of hell. So Samson not only has given this supernatural strength to take up these gates, it says he, he, he took them on his shoulders and he carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Well, if it is, if you take it literally, uh, Hebron is again 40 miles away, 64 kilometers away. And that would be some journey carrying the gates, wouldn't it? A 40-mile, 40, 40, uh, 64-kilometer journey uh, to, to face Hebron. Some suggest that he, he just carried it in the direction of Hebron. But it would be appropriate to, uh, spot for him to take the spoils of his victory because Hebron, as we know, means fellowship or companionship. It was a place of rich spiritual history. And the Lord would always have his people to seek, seek fellowship in the right spiritual atmosphere. And maybe many of Samson's troubles was due to the fact that he was a loner and did not have any true spiritual fellowship. And again, I really believe that we, when we isolate ourselves from the people of God, we become very weak. We need each other. We need fellowship. We need the companionship of the people of God. Uh, we need their encouragement. The scripture says we're supposed to exalt one another daily while it's yet today. And we need that. We need that daily encouragement. And yet, just as we would, uh, as we've gone through this study together, we've we tried to point out some, some faint foreshadowings of a greater judge and a greater deliverer than Samson. And just as they were waiting, watching to see Samson, uh, as he was locked in, as they thought, in the city, uh, were reminded of the fact that there was a time when the enemies thought they had the Lord Jesus shut in, not in a city, but in a tomb. Remember, there was a Roman seal put upon it. There was a guard brought there, and they watched thinking that they were finally rid of this man that was such an irritant to them. And yet we're reminded of the, the great hymn, vainly they watched his grave, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they sealed the dead, Jesus my Lord. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, 
Christ arose. So we considered this journey, this journey of lust. And now we want to think of another journey that he took, a journey of love. And verse 4 says it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Samson is about to lose his great physical strength. And, and again, sadly, many of the Lord's people have lost their spiritual strength for exactly the same reasons as Samson. Samson had power without purity. He had strength without self-control. And he did not know holiness. And it would ultimately lead to a crushing defeat. And so it says he loved this woman in the Valley of Sorek. Now, again, he's on a downward spiral he's in a valley valleys are always down actually all his journeys are downward he's always going down when he goes to enemy territory from from uh, where he lived he's always going downwards and so he's on a downward spiral he's in a valley but it's not just a valley it's called the valley of sorek and it was a valley of vines because <clears throat> sorek is descriptive of a, a, a vine that yields a very uh, purple grape which was very rich and flavorful and so again remember Nazarite vows remember he's he's not supposed to be in a vineyard he's not supposed to go to a place where he would be tempted with the fruit of the vine and we find him once again just as we saw before there's a little bit of deja vu in this chapter there's a little bit of here we go again same old same old uh, he's not learning his lessons and so he's down again in a valley, but a valley that is known for its vineyards and its grapes, the Valley of Sorek. And once again, while he's down there, it says he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek. And again, we just ask, what are you doing, Samson, in a valley filled with vines? Why are you continuing to repeat these blunders? And this is going to be his, really his final descent. Every time he goes into enemy territory, it's going down geographically. It's going down spiritually. It tells us this lady's name was Delilah. And it's kind of interesting because up to now, every woman in the story has been unnamed. His mother was never named. We never knew her name. Uh, she's Manoah's wife. <laughs> she's the woman. Uh, there was a woman in Timnath. We never found out what her name was. Uh, this harlot in the early part of the chapter, we have no idea what her name was. But now we have a name. He loved this woman, and her name was Delilah. There's a, a little bit of disagreement between Hebrew scholars as what the meaning of the name Delilah is. What there is agreement on is that it actually was a Hebrew name which is interesting. She's a Philistine. Quite clearly, her loyalty lies with the Philistines, but she has a Hebrew name. And, and many suggest that that shows, remember we said the Philistines, they didn't conquer Israel. They, they, it was more of assimilation. Uh, Israelites tolerated them. They tolerated the Israelites, and they began to have an influence basically through ecumenical toleration, through just getting along together, and they, 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 were, they made this uh, all possible. And so perhaps that would indicate that even there's a, a trading of names, that uh, some of the Hebrew names are being used for the Philistine women, and maybe they, they, the very opposite of those uh, of the children of Israel. But the Hebrew, it comes from a root that means to impoverish or to weaken. How very relevant, because certainly this man, Samson, is going to be weakened tremendously because of her invol his involvement with this woman. Others suggest it means devotee, uh, suggesting she may have been a temple prostitute. But I think that's unlikely. And I, the reason for that is that in the previous section, uh, it says he, he saw their harlot and it names her as a harlot, but there's no reference uh, to her being a harlot, although she's not she's not um, immune from taking money uh, for sexual purposes. Although she's not officially classed as a harlot, uh, she's certainly going to uh, sell out uh, because of money, uh, but she's certainly 
not called a harlot. <clears throat> so he loves this woman. Again, if only he had loved the Lord like he should have done, he would never have allowed his affections to become intertwined with a woman of the Philistines. Although she officially may not have been a harlot, as we're going to see, she's not immune from making money by using her sexual prowess to do so. Notice verse 5. It says, The lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, we know that the, there were five lords of the Philistines connected with the five major cities of the Philistine territory. And so that would mean that she would be given 5,500 pieces of silver. That would set her up for life. Remember, Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus with 30 pieces of silver. Here we got, uh, we will give every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver times five, 5,500 pieces of silver. A considerable sum of money that would set her up for life, but maybe at the back of her mind, and again, I don't want to put words or thoughts into this woman's mind, but maybe the story of the woman of Timnath would come to her remembrance too. And if you remember when the Philistine leaders came to her and told her to find out the riddle, they didn't offer her money, but they said, if you don't, we're going to burn your house down and you, you and your father as well. And ultimately that's what happened. So maybe at the back of her mind is, oh yeah, this is nice. I'll be set up for life. But also thinking about how the Philistines treat their own that don't do what they're told to do. Uh, perhaps that was something that was very much on her mind. Now, if Samson had stopped visiting Delilah, he would have kept his hair and his power. But he kept going back each time she implores him to reveal his secret. And we see just some of the insanity of sin in this chapter that this man, uh, he, it's almost like he's lost his mind. Uh, he's not thinking properly at all. I mean, doesn't he remember what happened with the woman of Timnath and how she kept on pestering him? Uh, has he forgotten that so quickly? Uh, again, look at the words of the book of Proverbs and chapter 27. Proverbs 27. I think you can write this over this incident here. It's just very insight and perhaps even in solomon's mind as he wrote this proverbs 7 verse 26 he says for she speaking of the um the the wayward woman it says for she hath cast down many wounded yea many strong men have been slain by her <laughs> although although solomon may have been thinking about samson uh, Solomon, Solomon didn't do much better himself when it came to women and their influence upon him. And so the enemy wants to rob us of the secret of our spiritual strength. And again, we notice in verse 5, that's really what it's all about. Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth. What's the secret of this man's strength? Now, why weren't they just intent on killing him? Like, remember, they had him in Gaza once. Maybe the idea was this. If we can find out the secret of his strength, maybe we can use it for our purposes. Maybe we can, we can whatever the magic formula is, we can apply it to ourselves. And so we want to know the secret of his great strength. And the enemy always wants to rob us of the secret of our spiritual strength. Now, you might ask the question, well, what is the, what is the secret of the spiritual strength of God's people? But well, we know what it is. It's prayer. It's communion with God. It's enjoying the scriptures. It's obeying the scriptures. 
its dependence upon the holy indweller, the Spirit of God. The secret of our strength, we know it well. It's not like this is a big secret for us. We know what the secret of the strength of God's people is, right? It's that intimacy through communion, through prayer, through dependence, the enjoyment of the scriptures, the, the application and obedience of the scriptures in our lives. That's where our strength comes from. And again, just like Samson, there's a desire to rob him of that. And the enemy wants to rob us of our spiritual strength. That's why it's so hard for you to get alone with God. Because the enemy knows that's where the strength lies, right? And isn't it interesting? I mean, you set yourself a time and you're going to shut yourself into the closet. You're going to pray. And if you're anything like me, as soon as you do that, all the things come into your mind of what needs to be done that day or that week. And all these thoughts came flooding in your mind. And it's like, it's a tremendous battle to enjoy that intimate communion with God. And why is that? Because the enemy knows this is where our spiritual strength lies. And this is where his point of attack is. If he can rob us of that somehow, uh, it makes us ineffective and useless and that's his goal, and that's his purpose. So verse 6, it says, Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be thinking, why does she want to know how they can bind me and afflict me? I mean, like, wouldn't you ask that question? <laughs> wouldn't you say, why is she even asking this question? And and so, we, again, we, we, we find that... Um, this this man he just seems to be clueless but again isn't it interesting that um sin definitely affects our ability to think rationally to think reasonably and i want to just talk about some lessons on temptation here before we go any further <clears throat> Because moral compromise always makes us vulnerable. But temptation always comes to us in attractive packages. I'm certain that the Philistines did not hire Tugboat Annie to try and win his affections. <laughs> in other words, this woman would be very attractive. And again, sin is attractive. Uh, it's pleasurable, right? The pleasures of sin for a season. It's only temporary, but it's pleasurable. And so the temptation always comes in a very attractive passage, package. It comes when we choose the wrong company. Samson kept choosing the wrong kind of girl. And he kept finding himself in wrong places. First Corinthians 15, 33 says this, be not deceived Evil communications corrupt good manners. Or the translations say evil company. <laughs> and it's true. If we're hanging around with the wrong people and we're in the wrong places, we're putting ourselves in a place where we're then very vulnerable to temptation. So Samson hasn't really immediately sensed his danger, uh, even though uh, the, it reminds us of a former incident. And so he. He basically, Samson talks to her and he says in verse seven, if they bind me with seven green withs uh, that were never dried, they sh then I'll be as weak and be as another man. And the lords of the Philistines brought up her seven green withs, which had not been dried. She bound him with them. And there were men lying in wait, abiding in her uh, with her in the chamber it must have been quite uh, a chamber to hide a band of philistines in there and again they must have been pretty quiet and he said unto him the philistines be upon thee samson and he break the widths as a thread of toe is broken when it touches the fire so his strength was not known one thing that we're going to learn about samson is that he was quite the sleeper He's not easily disturbed. Uh, she's going to manage to tie him up several times, weave his hair into a loom, shave his head, uh, and he sleeps through the whole thing. Now, I'm not quite sure what, 
what he was on, <laughs> but but boy, what, did he know how to sleep. And yet, isn't that the problem? That the church of the Lord Jesus, for the most part, is asleep. And very hard to wake us up. We seem to be comfortable in our sleep, even though the scripture says to the church at Romans, of the Romans, the church that understood sanctification, understood justification. Uh, some of them had made decisions to present their bodies a living sacrifice. And yet uh, he would say uh, to this group of believers in chapter 13, verse 11, that knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. And so there's this sense of time to wake up. And it's so possible for us uh, to be like Samson, lulled to sleep by the enticements and entertainments of the world so that we're totally ineffective for God. And here's this man sleeping through all of these things. And we often can be guilty of being asleep in the lap of the world. And so, obviously, the green widths didn't work to cause him to be just like other men. And again, we might ask the question is, is this, what would cause us to be just like other men? See, we're not like other men. We have the spirit of God living within us. We have the word of God. We have the truth of the gospel. We're not like other men. And if, if we are truly consecrated, Romans 12, 1 and 2, present our bodies a living sacrifice, we ought to be very different to the world. Clearly, Samson's different. He's not like other men. And it was because of this the spiritual power that was available to him through his consecration. And we should not be like other men because our consecration to God should separate us and make us different to the ordinary man. So notice verse 10. Delilah said to Samson, be Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes, downed him therewith, and said to him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber, and he brake them from off his arms like a thread. So again, this is just a, a, a basically a, a repeat, different uh, method to try and uh, sap him of his strength and, and bind him so he'd be just like other men. But again, it failed. And so visit number three, we notice verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, hitherto thou hast mocked me, told me lies, tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said to her, if thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. Now, again, this third incident, notice that he's getting closer to telling the truth. Now he's talking about his hair, the locks of his head. It's getting closer. And again, he's just, he's being worn down by this woman's constant kind of uh, nagging him. Uh, you know, kind of perhaps some tears. He, he, we know that he's not very effective at dealing with tears. And all of the this, it just leaves him more and more vulnerable. And he gets more and more to telling the truth. And yet, and again, we say, how, how, does, how does somebody get their hair weaved into a beam and manage to, to sleep through all of this? And yet he does. Notice verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, hitherto thou hast mocked me, and told me lies, tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, and she fastened it with the pin, said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awaked out of his sleep and went away. So again, just showing that he was sleeping through all of this. 
Now visit number four, verse 15 and 16. It says, he said unto him, how canst thou say, she said unto him, how canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and has not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death that he told her all his heart and said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. We need to notice Delilah's persistence, stubbornness even. And I want to just say this, that Satan doesn't give up easily he don't underestimate the enemy remember he's a roaring lion he's seeking whom he may devour and if he fails on previous occasions to get you to compromise it doesn't mean that he he's done in fact even with the lord jesus and the temptations it says he went away to come again in another season and the enemy doesn't rest that's why we have to be sober be vigilant because our enemy this roaring lion doesn't quit very easily so we think of samson's fatal flaws what were some of his fatal flaws one of them was a failure to flee We read again and again in scriptures the admonition to flee. And, and we need to be those that know when it's time to get out from a wrong place in a wrong situation. Remember Joseph. How did Joseph maintain his integrity? Can you imagine? I mean, again, I'm sure Potiphar's wife was a very beautiful, attractive woman. And can you imagine what that must be like every single day? To have this woman say to him, lie with me. And of course, he would always make sure he was never alone in the house with her. But one day, she got him on his own. And what did he do? He hightailed out of there. He fled. And yeah, he lost his garment, but he kept his integrity. And again, we might say this, that one of the things that we need to learn to do is flee. To, to, to get out of there. There's no shame in running away from temptation. Flee youthful lusts, Paul would say to Timothy. Now, let me tell you something. One thing I've learned is youthful lusts don't end when your youth ends. <laughs> the old fresh flesh does not improve with age. Uh, in fact, it, it gets worse <laughs> it seems to me as time goes on right i mean the battle gets worse i remember as a young believer asking an older brother does it ever get any easier and he looked at me and he said brother it doesn't get easier and the only <laughs> time that we'll ever not have to flee is when we're raptured and we have a new completely new disposition but until then there may be times when you and i need to get out of a situation that is very difficult. <clears throat> Secondly, I think not only did he fail to flee, there was a reason why he failed to flee. And that was over self-confidence. He obviously felt he could handle it. And, you know, we've got to remind him, our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And one of the things that we, we can be overly confident, we can say, that would never happen to me. I would never find myself in that situation. And maybe he thinks I've got away with things in the past and I can again in the future. And so there's this, this failure to flee, this over self-confidence that seems to ooze from Samson. And so he told her all his heart, you know, up to now, Samson has broken, it seems, every other part of his Nazarite vow. He's touched a carcass to get the honey out. He's been in the vineyard where he ought not to have been. Should have been separated from the fruit of the vine. And, and he's twice now he's been in a vineyard. 
And so it seems like the other aspects of his consecration, he has not treated them as seriously as he should. But one part he has retained is he's kept his hair unshaven since his birth. And that was a sign in one sense of his commitment to God. Yes, he had many failures, as we know, but he had trusted God at least in this thing. But now he reveals that secret. And so it says in verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. The lords of the Philistines came up unto her, brought money in their hand. She made him sleep upon her knees. She called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to to afflict him. Remember, we've, we've talked about the treacherous character of the Philistines throughout this whole thing. She began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And he said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I'll go out as other times as before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. This has to be one of the saddest verses in the whole of Scripture. It's a very serious thing, isn't it? When the Lord has abandoned this man. He's departed from him. It's not the only time we've seen that in scripture. Remember Ichabod in 1 Samuel? The glory has departed. Remember Saul? It says the spirit left him, 1 Samuel 16. David never forgot that, and we've often said that. David cried after his sin. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now we know that in the church age, were sealed by the spirit until the day of redemption but we can lose spiritual power and we can collectively lose the presence of god how do we know that this is a good place for us to to finish this section although we're going to come back we're not quite done here but i want you to look at revelation chapter 3 revelation chapter 3 in verse 20 this is laodicea And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. This is instructions to an assembly. And this assembly is obviously busy, but the Lord is not in the midst. He's outside and he's knocking on the door. And they... Wist not that the Lord had departed from them. They didn't realize Ichabod was written all over the door of the assembly in Laodicea. He's asking, is any individuals in there that still value my fellowship? (laughs) Because corporately the whole has gone. And so these are very sobering lessons in the life of Samson. We're not done. There's more for us to consider in this chapter. But again, we need to remember, perhaps as a closing statement, he that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he also fall. May God encourage us and challenge us with these thoughts. Amen.